Good morning. Good Good to be in God's house as we worship together today. And we're glad that you're here. Please make sure you take the time to use the registration pad. You'll find that near the center aisle. uh, And then pass that down the row. Make sure everybody has the opportunity uh, to register their attendance. Uh, And if you're here for the first time and you'd like to stand and let us know maybe who you are and where you're from, we would invite that at this time. Anybody? All right, no worries, no worries. We're glad that you're here. All right, number of announcements for us this morning, so hang on. Uh, You have an insert in your bulletin uh, in regards to Wonderful Wednesday. Uh, We're a little more than halfway through the summer, so that'll be upon us uh, sooner than we think. Uh, But we're always looking for folks as adult volunteers to help out with that program uh, as an assistant, a teacher, in tutoring, uh, and the like. So. Uh, please be in prayer about where you might be able to serve uh, on Wednesday's great program that we do here as an outreach to the school next door uh, and always in need of a little extra help. So uh, please keep that before you. The altar flowers today are in honor of the Tiedemans for their 61st wedding anniversary. Congratulations to both of you. A thank you for those who participated in the patriotic concert a week or so ago, um, both in the audience and on stage, et cetera, and back behind the scenes. We raised $1,792 uh, for the music ministry, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. Also, the Boy Scouts received $1,770 from the men's group and the Genesis Sunday School class to help send three boys to Boy Scout camp, so thank you for that. Uh, As you can see before you, the prayer shawls are here on the altar rail, and if you know of someone who would be in need, or if you yourself would be in need of one, uh, please feel free to come forward and take one. They've been prayed over, uh, and they're meant as a ministry of comfort for those uh, in need. Dessert in the show will be this Tuesday, that's day after tomorrow, Tuesday the 18th at 1.30 in the afternoon, Uh, In the Family Life Center, we will feature the talented jazz band Southland Dixie Stompers. So it looks to be a good show. (laughs) I think Marianne might know them or like them or something. Yeah, okay, all right. Admission is free, of course, with the opportunity to donate. But please RSVP. You can sign up on a sign-up sheet in the Narthex, or you can call the office, or you can use Shirley's email. Again, that's in the bulletin for you as well. Just helps us in planning. So let us know if you plan to be here Tuesday. United Women of Faith Circle Meeting, the Sarah Circle, will meet this Thursday for breakfast and fellowship uh, at the Perkins on 441. All the women of the church are invited uh, because all the women of the church are considered members of United Women of Faith. Uh, So you're invited to that circle meeting. Also, the food pantry has items uh, of need, pork and beans, uh, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, And also, you can always make a financial contribution to our food pantry. Uh, What many of you may not realize is that in addition to the food items, uh, the food pantry supplements uh, through the purchase of other food items to help supplement that. Uh, And we serve, what, about 200 or so a month, is that right? Yeah, and so there's a great deal of need with others on the waiting list. Uh, That money's going to run out probably the end of December. Uh, So again, if you can help or would like to help in that way, uh, please do. We would would invite and welcome uh, that gift as well. I don't have any other announcements, so would you take this opportunity to please stand and greet those around you as we continue in worship. It's wonderful to see how friendly this family of God is. I'm going to ask all of you to please scurry back to your seats and let's begin with our call to worship. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Jesus sent the Spirit of Truth to teach us and give us peace. That same Spirit is with us now. Let us worship God. Let's open up our hearts and voices and sing, uh, praise, the, so, praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Page 66, if you want to use your hymnal. sing, found on page 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. Just
us remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He said to heaven, and sitteth in the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. As we go to God in prayer this morning, I remind you of those who are listed in your bulletin as always as we pray for them by name together. But if you would at this time join with me as we go to God in prayer. Almighty God, how grateful we are for the opportunity to gather together here as the body of Christ, for the opportunity to be in fellowship with one another, and to feel and know the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit working in and through us. We pray that as we join our hearts and minds together, along with our voices in praise to you, that you would receive honor and glory as you alone deserve and that the word that we hear today would help us to live according to your purposes and to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. We pray for those who are listed before us, knowing full well that you, O oh God, know their needs more than we do, and yet out of love for them, we intercede for them. We pray for Ron, Kathy and Terry, Gary and Cheryl, Jack and Barbara, Pam, the Dengler family, Carl and Julie, Bob, the Farner family, Howard and Faye, Bill and Barbara, the Franson family, Alan and Shirley, John, Jean, Rick, Linda, the family of John McDonald, William, Lorenzo, Glenn and Chris, April, Pastor Wendy, Rudy and Barbara, the Newell family, Jeff and Paula, Charlie, Chip, the family of Ed Ross, Linda, Lena, Carolyn, Charlie, and Carol. Almighty God, again, we pray for our brothers and sisters, those we have mentioned, and for those on our hearts. And we pray also, Almighty God, for ourselves in the places where we find need or want or answers. There are times in our lives when we feel defeated, disappointed, and discouraged. We may feel alone or abandoned. We may convince ourselves that you no longer hear us or care for us. We may also feel angry or possess a desire for vengeance on those who have hurt us. But we know that you are patient with us. 
and with our so-called enemies. You are a God of wrath, but your mercy endures forever. So we pray that your spirit of love would overwhelm us, reminding us of your compassion for us and your steadfast march towards justice. Remind us that you are the one who holds all things in your hand and who makes all things work for good for those who love you. Thank you for being the everlasting God who watches over us and provides for us and may we ever more fully trust you in all things. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, praying together as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward and we present to God his tithe and our offering, I invite Anne to come forward and lead us in our prayer of thanksgiving. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, we come to you today with hearts full of love and praise. We are reminded daily of the many things you have given to us and have done for us. We are surrounded by an abundance of beauty in our world that we may take for granted, such as our beautiful sunrises and sunsets, the bird songs, flowers, oceans, and stars. Help us stop and take time to appreciate these gifts you have given us. The words to an anthem recently sung by our choir help summarize our feelings of thankfulness. O oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. For we can only wonder at every gift you see, at blessings without number and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We honor and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. We pray that we will carry your message out into this community. Help us to follow the example Christ made for us. Help us support those less fortunate through our tithes and offerings we so willingly give. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.
I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, today's scripture is read from the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, of Elkosh. What does that all mean? So, a little interpretation. Oracle means prophecy. Concerning Nineveh, Nineveh was a large pagan city in antiquity that symbolized enmity, deep hatred with God. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire at the time. The city had to repent of its wicked ways or God would destroy it within 40 days. Well, <clears throat> Nahum is the prophet and they believe that his hometown is Elkosh. And so this is the reading. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and prolongs it against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm and the clouds and are the dust of his feet. Draw water for the seas, strengthen your forts, trample the clay, tread the mortar, take hold of the brick mold. There the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you off, it will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants more than the stars of heavens. The locust sheds its skin and flies away. Your guards are like grasshoppers. Your scribes are like swarms of locusts settling on the fences on a cold, cold day. When the sun rises, they will fly away. No one knows where they have gone. Your shepherds are asleep. O king of Israel, your noblest slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. There is no assuaging your hurt. Your wound is mortal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For who has ever escaped your endless cruelty. The word of God for the people of God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's heavy. Y'all go home and read Nahum pretty regularly, right? Yeah, all the time, all the time, all three chapters. Um, so today we're going to be uh, beginning a new sermon series entitled Majoring in the Minors. And we're going to be doing something that we often don't do here in the church in the West and uh, be talking about the minor prophets. Uh, do you all know how many minor prophets there are? No? No? I see you counting in your head. Uh, twelve. So there's twelve minor prophets. Do we know why they are called the minor prophets? Sorry? Because they're not major. Yeah, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, we can go with that. So we, we call them the minor prophets uh, because they're short. You know, it's... The books are short. Uh, so, so Nahum is three chapters long. Uh, you might think about Jeremiah in, in contrast. Um, is like 52 chapters long or something like that. And so we talk about those big books a lot, but we oftentimes don't get into the little, little ones. Uh, for those that uh, went to churches that use the lectionary, uh, I used to use the lectionary all the time. Uh, Nahum's not even in the lectionary. Uh, so it's, it's something that we very uh, rarely get into. And I'm not going to lie, I am both really excited and also absolutely terrified to work through the Minor Prophets together. Because if you've read them, you, you know that they don't pull their punches. 
Uh, they are deeply contextual to their people and their time and their places. And these are peoples and times and places that we don't talk about very often. And sometimes we just don't know a ton about. Uh, sort of like Nahum. And sometimes when I read them, I'm left wondering, God, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, if, you, if you read Nahum, it is, it's just a very bloody book. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, when, I, when I was reading through it, I was like, you know, I'm having a hard time finding Jesus in here. Um, and then I read uh, some work from, uh, from a, a theologian from the Congo, and he gave me a lot of insight that was really helpful. But these minor prophets, they make Jesus' conversations with the Pharisees look really kind, and his parables like super clear, and Paul's rebuke of the early church quite gentle. Uh, before we get into it today, though, I do want to say that we're going to be talking about hard things. Uh, we're going to be talking about tragedy and grief and loss and anger and despair. And so if, if you feel like you need to take space, go ahead and do that. So will you join me in prayer um, as we ask God for help as we dive into Nahum together? God, you are always with us, just as you were with Nahum and the people of Judea all those years ago. Um, help us to face this text that we don't like looking at. Expose something in us this morning that we don't like looking at. Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears. In your holy name we pray. Amen. When I was in seminary, my preaching professor, Chuck Campbell, shared with us how at the cross and in Christ, the sacred and the profane become fully entangled and enmeshed because at the time of Christ, there was no death more profane than the humiliation that we know to be the torture device of the cross. And at the same time, there is nothing more sacred than the full incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. And at the same time, Chuck also shared that all of our scripture has this mix of the sacred intertwined with the profane. Because church life is messy. And so scripture meets us in the messiness of our lives. In the time of Nahum, Assyria ruled most of the world that would have been known to the Judeans. In the time of Nahum, Judah was conquered by Assyria. And Assyria was one of the harshest conquerors you could ever imagine. Not only did they impose the heaviest taxes, but when they conquered a nation, they enslaved them and they scattered them across all the other conquered nations. So that way they couldn't rebel. When others would dissent, there would be public executions by the state in the streets. For the prophet Nahum in the mid-600s B.C., life was unimaginably horrific. So when you go home today and you read those three chapters of Nahum, when you read his cries to God to commit these bloody atrocities, I ask that you give Nahum grace. For though times have changed and I've never known the annihilation that Nahum did, what I do know is that when tragedy has struck my own life, I too have been filled with despair and I too have been filled with rage. Church, I've said it before and I'll say it again, all scripture speaks to the present moment it was written at and it speaks to every present moment thereafter. Nahum speaks to us today. It speaks to our hearts, it speaks to our minds, to our souls, to our bodies. We can all agree that we have never known 
what it means to be a conquered people the way the ancient Judeans did under Assyria in Nahum's day. And although we've never lived that life, we don't have to look far across the globe to see devastation, do we? Let us have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's easy to glance across the sea at Ukraine right now or look not far back at the troubles in Ireland or the war that ravaged the Democratic Republic of Congo or blood spilt here on our own soil only a few generations past. When we look at these places of devastation and tragedy in the streets, we see this apocalyptic poetry of Nahum expressed by the people again and again and again and again, don't we? When I was in seminary, one of our professors, Dr. Davis, told us to read a dissertation from her former student professor, well, now professor, Dr. Jacob Onyumbe, a uh, professor uh, who now works in Congo and is from the Congo. We were told that Dr. Onyumbe was one of the best Nahum scholars in the world, not simply because he had so thoroughly studied the text, not simply because he knew all the Hebrew in and out, not simply because he had studied the ancient cultures of Assyria and Judea. No, he was one of the best Nahum scholars in the world because he knew the life of Nahum intimately. He lived the life of Nahum in his bones. In his dissertation, Dr. Onyumbe shared the pain of growing up in the war-torn Congo. He named the unexpressible pain and devastation in the aftermath. He shared how in the midst of pain and despair, people responded with song and with poetry. When all else was taken away and destroyed, all that was left to them was their voice and the ash on the ground. These were the only tools they had left to express what was on the inside, the pain, the sorrow, the anger. He said if they did not let it out, they could not survive. Dr. Unyumbe said he understood Nahum. He understood needing a God that would show up and end this. He understood needing a God of rage, a God who would meet him in the pits of despair. I learned a lot from reading his words about that intersection between the sacred and the profane. The profane that Nahum cries out, the anger he must let out, the anger he needs of God. We heard it in verse 15 from chapter 3, didn't we? There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like locusts. Church, this is where the sacred in Scripture meets the profane. We hear the cries of anguish, meet the need to be seen, the need to be heard. We hear it all across our world, don't we? We hear it from our great songwriters and our great poets and our great artists. This is the profane that we hear in the words of Jewish poet Abel Mirapol who just before World War II, Abel was looking across the ocean at Nazi Germany and seeing the genocide of his people. And then sitting there in his apartment in New York with pen and paper in hand. As a Jewish man in the 30s, he began to also look across the U.S. And he said that we weren't treating black folks all that different than his own people were being treat in Germany. And so he penned a poem that would become the song Strange Fruit, sung by Billie Holiday across the South. Verses 1 and 3. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. 
Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the tree to drop. Here is a strange and a bitter crop. You hear it, don't you? The profane and also the profound pain. The profane and the grotesque that we find all throughout our scriptures can be found all throughout the art of our world. That grotesque of the gospel that meets us not where we want to be one day, but meets us where we are now. The grotesque of the gospel that meets us in the pain of the cross that we carry today. The truth is that we often ignore scriptures like Nahum because they're dirty and they're messy and they're bloody. If I'm honest, Nahum makes me deeply uncomfortable. It's easier for me to avoid the pain I see in scripture because I just don't want to look it in the face. I don't want to be honest with the pain in the text because to do so would require me to also be honest with myself. To be honest with the pain that I see across the world. To be honest at times with the pain that's also on the inside. We ignore much of our Bibles because it's hard to sit in. We ignore it because it's not only divine, it is also so deeply human. It's truly incarnational. Scripture helps us express the inexpressible. It gives us permission to speak, and it gives us the ability to hear and see our neighbors. Just this, uh, just yesterday, I was at a funeral for a friend after having already prepared this sermon. And uh, it was uh, interesting to me how after his son had finished um, the eulogy he had written for his father, he said, you know, I, I've told you a lot about my dad and how much I love him, but it, I, can't, I can't tell you everything, can I? And, and so he, he ended with a poem, a poem that at times was not the most coherent, but also a poem that we all felt, nonetheless, a poem that let out what was on the inside, the hell he was experiencing. And I think that is some of the deepest truth that we find in Nahum. I don't know about you, but the two hardest parts about scriptures like Nahum for me, about songs and poems like I heard yesterday, are sometimes they are for me. And sometimes they're for me to learn to hear and see my neighbor more clearly. So first, sometimes they're for us. Given all that Nahum must have gone through, all he must have seen, all he must have lost, the rage Nahum expresses makes sense, doesn't it? The rage Nahum cannot keep inside, the despair that is overwhelming him, church, it must be let out. Sure, we might not have experienced the same devastation that he did, and at the same time, we have something to learn, don't we? Because some in this room, and I would guess most in this room, have experienced deep, deep, undescribable, unbearable pain. Maybe the loss of a friend, loss of a child, Sibling, spouse. Life is messy and it is heavy. 
In these times, we need books like Nahum, Job, the Psalms. We need the poetry of ancient Israel that calls out to God in anger and in wrath and despair and sorrow and say, this is all I have right now for you, God. And you better be able to take it. We need these scriptures because we don't always have the words ourselves. We have to let it out. And I think that's why we need art in our own day as well. It helps us name the unnameable. And I think it also helps us see scripture more clearly as well. The following is a poem by Padraig Otuma. He's an Irish poet that lived through the troubles in Ireland. He is quite skilled at naming both individual and corporate pain. This poem is entitled, Not Yet. We'll look at a couple of his other works today. Not Yet. You're too young to know about the troubles, the peace man said. And the young man said. Father shot dead, mother fell apart, brother fell in on herself, other brothers sent to live with others, and me is mother's everything. I was farmed around, and now, years later, we have found ourselves back beneath a shared and troubled ceiling. Not yet. No one's too young to know about the troubles. Y'all, I think Padraig is right. Though we might not have experienced civil war in our streets the way he did, I don't think anyone is too young or too old to know the troubles of life, are we? When one of my childhood best friends died tragically and abruptly about two years ago now, I was filled with rage. And I was also filled with despair. And during that time, I needed the poetry of Nahum and the Psalms and Job and Padraig. At times, I needed a God of rage. And at other times, I needed a God that was silent because there was nothing anyone could do or say to make this right again. We need books like Nahum because they give us permission, don't they? They give us permission to be profane and grotesque, to be filled with dark humor and dark words because Nahum reminds us that at times God sits with us in the darkness of this world. And after all, what could be more beautiful what could be more sacred? What could be more profane than a God who would sit with us in the mud? Hear me clearly. There are no bad emotions. Sure, there are healthy times and ways and places and spaces for all emotions, but none of them are bad. Anger, rage, well-directed can be a gift from the Almighty to express the inexpressible. When my friend died, scriptures like Psalms and Nahum challenged me. They said, stop holding it inside. When my friend died suddenly and abruptly and tragically on a Friday a few years back, I knew fury on Friday. And I also learned the gift of silence on Holy Saturday. You know, Jesus didn't just die and raise the next day and tell us to get over it. <laughs> nah. He gave us the gift of space and time to grieve because he knew that we needed it. He knew that we needed space and time to let it out. 
during the months after my friend passed, those times that I was bottling it up when I was trying to hold it on the inside, the despair, the anger, the sorrow, my body always kept the score, whether it be headaches or stomach aches or deep fatigue. In that time, I needed to be heard, I needed to be seen, I needed to cry out again and again and again and again. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all needed to cry out like Nahum. Church, often I avoid scriptures like Nahum because I don't want to face the pain that's on the inside. Now for that second part. Because there's other times, like now, when I'm doing good, right? And I avoid scriptures like Nahum because I just don't want to look them in the eyes. Because when I'm doing good, it's just a little bit too raw for me, isn't it? It'd be so much easier if Ben was just preaching on the feeding of the 5,000 today, right? A happy scripture. Because Nahum makes me uncomfortable. It's easier to avoid Nahum's pain, his suffering, because it's not mine in this season. And we know ourselves, don't we? When the pain is not ours in this season, then we'll do everything in our power to avoid it. Church, we read Nahum because it gives us eyes to see. It gives us ears to hear. We read Nahum so we can look our neighbor in the eyes when they cry out like Nahum in Job in Christ. We are called to bear witness. We are called to show up just as Christ does. And now, a second poem from Podrick, entitled, To Hell and Back. He is called to hell, this man. He is called to glory. He knows well those twisted ways and those who've lost their story. He is called to clay, this man. He is called to yearning. He has heard of hidden streams that heal those tired of burning. He's searching out those raised in hell. He wants to know the things they know. He believes in a dreamland where the ragged people go. He is called to quiet now. He is called to silence. To squat down on the breaking ground with those who have swallowed violence. He is called to anguished thoughts. He is called to flowers. To find in hell's own lonely fury that which no flame devours. I saw him on the midway path. I saw he carried two things only. On his trip to hell, this man, he is called to story. You know, I find it interesting that the early church, as well as many still today, believe that on Holy Saturday, Jesus went to hell and broke its gates wide open and let every single person.